I am Vinnie Totterton, folks. Your good intentions have been stolen, but don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent when we start this process, but hang in there. Before long, you will be lean and mean. This is the Friday show. This is a one-on-one. -on -one. This is when we get someone with way more knowledge than I can ever, ever imagine having in five lifetimes. And we get these people on the show and they, they give us uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. This woman has been on the show before. Uh, she has a book out there called Sacred Cow. She also has a movie by the same name, which you know, I Rudy clap that. That, that. that movie deserves a Rudy clap because um, it was just amazing. Uh, she is a registered dietitian. I'm going off of memory from the last time she was on the Friday show. Registered dietitian, and she's got a global food justice initiative that she's pushing. I'm talking about Diana Rogers. How are you doing, Pumpkin? I'm good. How are you? Did I get any of that wrong? Because Diana, as you know, I don't write down notes. No, that's that's it. Yep. So the the book and film came out during COVID, um, and you know it's it's quite possible that the book has the highest ratio of five star reviews to low sales possible. <laughs> um, uh, and the the film also came out, so it's available out on um, you know Amazon and iTunes. And yeah, I think you reached out to me because I have this new project that um, I'm working on called the Global Food Justice Alliance, which is pretty much an extension of the film. Uh, it's an advocacy group for um, trying to make sure that meat remains, meat and other animal source foods um, remain in dietary policy, hospitals, school lunch, uh, worldwide. Um, that's a tall order because they're mm -hmm. doing everything in their power to make it go away. Um, before we get into the global food initiative or, or justice, what, mm -hmm. what are you calling global food justice? I'm calling it global food justice only because I'm really trying to point out the elitism behind a diet that does not include meat. Uh, it's really easy to do that if you live in LA or New York. Not so easy if you're a hungry person, don't have the access to all those uh, goji berries and supplements you need. And, um, and in many parts of the world, you don't even have access to the variety of vegetables uh, that, that you might need. So I'm really trying to point out, you know, not only is meat healthy, but, um, but pulling meat away from people is privilege um, that this, group tends to, you know, feel that they, they kind of have that word in their pocket and it's, and it's not true. So, but yeah, we can, we can talk about sacred cow. We can talk about meat, whatever you want. I, I want to get into all of it. <clears throat> Let's mm -hmm. start with sacred cow, the book okay. and um, sacred cow, the, uh, the movie first, the book. Um, you just mentioned that the book has a, how many five-star reviews does it have on Amazon? Because that matters. You, that's not fake when those reviews are real. Oh, um, yeah. Any idea? You, you don't have to give me the exact number, but thereabouts. I'm, I mean, it's way over a thousand for sure. Hold on. Sacred cow in all departments here. So we have, yeah, 1,018. It's all five stars. Um, and I think I might have made 10 grand on the book so far. Wow. I mean, uh, did you self-publish or is it through a publisher? No, or? it's through a publisher. Um, and actually the, it's the same publisher as the China study. They're a vegan publisher um, and they were very supportive. They really tried that where the problem was with Amazon during COVID. So they weren't on their game. We were giving away the film in exchange for a pre-order of the book, which was fantastic. So we had, I don't know, seven or 8,000 pre-orders that we moved that first week, but we didn't really move them because Amazon only fulfilled about 2,000 of those books. And so for the New York Times list, it only counts for books that were actually shipped. And so right. we missed our chance. Um, we were kind of hoping with the Joe Rogan podcast that um, it would come back up again. I flew out there and it was the Austin ice storms. And I got stuck in a hotel um, with no running water and no bottled water for a week. Wow. Um, I was literally living on like white claw and tuna, like 
it was wow. crazy. And Rob lives an hour south, or lit, he just moved to Montana, but he was living an hour south. I couldn't even get to Rob's house because the roads were just pure ice and they yeah. don't have any salt or, or anyway. So, um, so that never happened and he never rescheduled. And so um, that was the end of the life of the book for, for now. I mean, it still continues to move and people tell me they love it, but it just was uh, pretty heartbreaking um, to, for the, the, the financial and, uh, and also I, you know, I used to work for NPR. I couldn't get any coverage at all in the New York times, NPR. I mean, I got my first cookbook in the LA times. I couldn't get any, anyone to touch this book. And it's really well cited. Um, and it's interesting because you can get people behind the idea that regenerative grazing at like cows can be a, a beneficial, you know, for ecosystem function. But if you also say that meat is a healthy food, it's, I mean, you put those two things together and all of a sudden all my potential friends on the left wouldn't, you know, who are the media and our LA and our Netflix, um, they wouldn't have it because they're so, you know, I, I, I was, I'm pretty firmly against the vegan diet and that just is not something they want to touch. I was on a national radio show <clears throat> during COVID. Um, I was pushing when my second movie, Fat 2, came out. I was pushing it. I, I put the whole thing together during COVID, and I was pushing it during, you know, the whole one-year lockdown. And I was doing <clears throat> a national radio show from my, my basement, and the guy said something that you just said, which I find very interesting because – these were your words, not mine. These were his words, not mine. Why does it seem like the whole initiative about veganism, number one, comes from the left? Mm -hmm. And number two, the whole initiative to cancel meat. Well, the whole cancel culture is the left. I, I think everybody can agree on that, even the left. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because you see, I'm not right, left, or center. I'm, I'm just... I'm, I'm an androgynous person when it comes to politics. Uh, my, my feeling is, uh, excuse my language, I don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. Believe what you want to believe, do what you want to do. This is America, it's a great place. Do and believe what you want. But it does seem that the vegan initiative to push veganism and to quote unquote cancel meat, cancel culture is a left thing. We, we agree on that, right? Is that... Yeah. And, and, uh, and I'm not, I'm not anti-left at all. I'm not anti, I, I'm, I am, um, live and let live. I, I, yeah, I might classify myself as like a, a left center libertarian, maybe is socially. Um, I, I believe in, um, a, a lot of issues that the left believes in. Um, but, um, I also think that, pulling a nutritious food away from people based on zero science and evidence is elitist and wrong. And when I point that out to people, I am immediately classified as, you know, I might as well be, um, you know, a, a racist. And I've been called racist. And in fact, I was so harassed by somebody by being called a racist, I actually reached out to some lawyers and I was like, don't they need proof? And I found out you actually do need proof to call someone that. Um, and, and I was about to sue them for slander. Um, it, it became this big thing. But anyway, um, to say that meat is healthy is, is a really awful thing today. Um, and the fact is, meat is a healthy food that humans have eaten for three and a half million years. Um, there are better and worse ways to produce it, but there are also better and worse ways to produce plant-based foods as well. So telling someone that is food insecure and doesn't have a lot of money that they should eat beans and rice instead of meat because it's better for their ethics when 
to get 30 grams of protein, you need to eat 700 calories worth of beans and rice and all those carbs, as you know, right. um, compared to 180 calories of beef with zero carbs. Um, and we've got 70% of Americans are overweight or obese. It disproportionately impacts people of color. And, and so to tell these folks that they should be eating a vegetarian diet uh, and not eating meat because it's grown in an evil way, which by the way, beef is the least of the evils when it comes to meat, um, especially compared to chicken or pork. It's more nutrient dense right. than chicken or pork. And what a lot of people don't realize is that um, cattle only spend a few months on a feedlot. Most of their lives are out on pasture. Sure. Chicken and pork are hundred percent indoors in a factory. Um, I, I, you bring up racism in food. Uh, this is not the first time I'm hearing this. I don't know if you ever saw the movie, What the Health? It's oh, a yeah. vegan propaganda movie that's just full of lies. It starts with lies and the lies continue all the way through. Um, they have a, um, an African-American, I'm guessing he's African-American. He's, he's a black man, um, who's a, a, a doctor and he, he categorizes, um, dairy as being racist dairy, mm -hmm. dairy, it, it, that's racist food. Folks, yeah, there's... You, I'm kidding. Go watch what the health that's yeah. in the, this is my, not, not me paraphrasing. This is in the movie. There's another film um, called They're Trying to Kill Us, which is on its way out, or maybe it came out, and it's all about how uh, white people are trying to kill black people by feeding them meat. Um, and I'm just so shocked. And I even hear people talking about like an African heritage diet, and of course it doesn't have a lot of meat in it, and that's how African Americans should be eating. And I'm like, you know, I have, I'm friends with um, Eid Fox, who's Black Carnivore on Instagram. Um, I have a, a lot of other friends who are Black. And, you know, we talk about how, like, that makes zero sense that there's an African heritage diet that's low meat inherently, because there's a reason why they didn't get meat. <laughs> And it was because of white people. <laughs> and so to say that, you know, it's, it, it, it's like culturally, um, important not to eat meat. Um, I would actually argue the complete opposite and say like, take back your power and eat some meat. Yeah. You know, women especially um, need to, you know, they're so meat phobic, they need to be eating meat. And, you know, historically women were denied meat. So I'm, I'm very uh, meat forward from a, a social justice perspective, um, telling people, you know, not everyone has access to regenerative grass fed beef. I do, but, and I think the people who do should definitely support those farmers. But if you don't, it's still a better option than even beans and rice, um, as far as nutrients. And if people want to talk about impoverished, you know, look, I, I came from middle class, my grandparents on both sides, um, never made more than minimum wage their entire life, ever, ever. And I'll give you the jobs. My grandfather uh, worked um, as a, a truck driver driving bulk mud to oil rigs. What that is, is the chemical that they send down oil rigs. Mm -hmm. He did that on the weekends. And during the week, he was a janitor. Okay, these are minimum wage jobs. Uh, my grandfather on the other side, uh, who died when I was six, um, worked as a, 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 a toll taker at the Sunshine Bridge back when they took tolls. He died in that booth. Wow. He died of a heart attack when he was young. Um, his wife, my grandmother, worked as a sales clerk in a department store. Now, Diana, does any of this sound like rich people? No. Any of it. <laughs> I, and if you go, well, what, hang on, Vinny, go back a generation. Go back a generation, most of them were still away on boats coming from Italy. There you have it. These were not rich people. My Papa Tripodi, my grandmother's father and Mama Virginia were stowaways on a boat from Italy who land in New Orleans. These people had whatever was in their pocket was their income. That, that was all they had saved. Um, 
My, both of my parents were the first from each of their family to get a degree, and they became school teachers. Again, school teachers are not rolling thick when it comes to money, especially when you have four kids. We were not rich. We always had meat. How is that? W was my family stealing meat? No, they went to the grocery store and bought what they can afford. It was, uh, you know, just chuck roast and this and that, you know, sausage. You know, my mom still buys, Serena and I laugh about it. About it. My mom still buys, we call it sale salmon, because she only buys it on sale. Okay. Mm -hmm. These are not rich people. And we had meat. Four kids had meat. My grandparents had meat. And my grandfather talked about a time when the only thing he had to get meat was a shotgun was to go out and hunt. Right? Mm -hmm. This was the world I grew up in. Meat was always available. They stressed it, you know, we had vegetable gardens. By the way, folks, we didn't have vegetables from the grocery store. We had gardens that we went and had to harvest the stuff ourselves. That's where our vegetables came from. This is reality. You do not need to be rich to eat meat. What, what say you, Diana? Well, and I think just taking that a step further and pointing out that it's uh, it's fine if an individual wants to be vegan, but I think they need to understand that. And I went to walmart.com and I looked at the price of a uh, Beyond Burger versus organic grass-fed beef and organic uh, grass-fed beef is half the price per pound of Beyond Burger. But what Beyond Burger does is they sell it in the half pound uh, weight, but they put it in a large container. So it looks like you're getting more than you are. And it's competitive with, um, you know, the better meats. So it's twice as expensive. It's not as nutritious. It comes from very horrible agriculture practices. Um, they like to say that it's less greenhouse gases, but that's oh, no. a really big red herring that is not reflective of the whole environmental destruction process that a product like Beyond Burger is. And we know that the only RCT done on meat versus less meat was on kids in Kenya. And it was a school group. One group got a meat snack, one group got a milk snack, and one group got extra just calories. And it was the meat group that excelled athletically, behaviorally, and academically. Um, that's the only RCT that we have. And so programs like Meatless Mondays that are in action in New York City public schools are based on zero evidence, um, the, but they're, it's all virtue signaling. Um, and so we need to understand that if, if you wanna be vegan, it's fine, but it, it, it takes a lot of planning, it's expensive, and it's a privileged diet that not a lot of people have the opportunity to partake in. And it absolutely should not be forced upon. And so that's that's where I'm moving forward. There's there's some stuff going on with the United Nations right now. And, and there's other policy, there's stuff going on in Berkeley. And so I'm about to get super loud about um, this is, they're a bunch of elitists basically. Well, Diana, I haven't mentioned much about my next movie yet, but I'm going to mention more about it right now than I have. So um, okay. as you know, I did fat documentary and then fat two. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was basically the same players, basically fat two was a continuation of fat a documentary. And as it turns out, uh, according to my mother, more critically acclaimed, everyone likes fat two more than the more popular fat, the original fat a documentary. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen, have you seen either of my, it's mm -hmm. okay to say no. I have. Um, my third movie is a complete departure from those two movies. Okay. Completely. It is all about Beyond Burger and Possible Meat. All of the fake stuff that's coming, we're going to show the truth behind this. Not propaganda, folks. We're going to show the truth because I did a deep dive and mm -hmm. figured out exactly what was going on. Here's the interesting part about this, Diana. And, you know, you mentioned elitist. I went to the head of the vegans. I went to the, you know, I invited Walter Willett. McDougal, Gregor or Gregor, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. I went to all the top guys. 
And by the way, I'm going to be showing their return letters to me, the emails they sent back to me. Mm -hmm. um, I did not want to do a one sided film. It's not a one sided film. But I wanted everyone to come to the table. Because I'm not trying to do what the vegans do where I do a propaganda film. I wanted to bring vegans to the table to hear what they're talking about. Sounds fair enough, right? Sounds easy enough. Mm -hmm. Categorically turned down by every vegan expert out there. Mm -hmm. Walter Willett, he's the he's the head of the snake, folks. He's the guy you want. You seem to be chomping at the bit. Tell tell who Walter Willett is. Well, he was in my film. Um, oh. I actually did interviewed him twice. Um, and it could have been because the release he signed just said unnamed food documentary. Um, and, uh, so I interviewed him once in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, and I interviewed him again, right in Harvard. Ironically, there was a portrait of Walter Willett right between myself and Walter Willett. And we actually had set up a third camera on the windowsill just in case he walked out to show this ridiculous portrait of Walter Willett that right. was on the wall next to him. Love and that. he is so full of contradiction. So the best quote of the film is Walter Willett saying, um, we've known for, farmers have known for years that if you want to fatten up an animal, you feed them lots of grain and put restrict their movement by putting them in a close, con uh, I forget what he said, like a close pen where they can't move around. Right. And humans are like that too. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. It's in my trailer. It's in the film. Um, and then I, I pressed him more. And in the interview, um, he, he so, oh, you asked me to like say who he is. So yeah. he, he <laughs> now might admit that a keto type diet is okay. Like there was information about that, but it has to be a plant-based keto diet. Right. Which I don't even understand. I mean, it's I impossible to do unless you just eat, you know, I don't know, olive Coconut oil, 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 oil all day. I, I don't oil. understand. Yeah. It makes no sense. I mean, what, what traditional culture was eating a ketogenic vegan diet? You know, like that is just. But hang on. We'll get into that in a second. I, I, I sense your anger. Explain who he is. And then. Oh we'll yeah. Sorry. It. So he, he is the head of the, um, of the basically Harvard School of Nutrition. He is a key player in the dietary guidelines. He is Mr. <laughs> nutrition, mainstream nutrition here in the US. And he, what he does is he's a, a, an epidemiologist. So he looks at large population studies, which can't show cause at all. Um, so they just look at these populations. So it's the, like the nurse's health study, very large study, all self-reported data, which is completely, it should be non scientific. It is non, yeah. It's non-scientific, let's be and honest. And I mean, you can, it was really interesting because when I was at this conference in Zurich, he got put in his place really hard by um, that guy from Stanford, um, Ioannis, the, John Ioannis, yeah. I, I can't pronounce his last name, but um, he hates epidemiology and he mocks it and I mean, you, he showed how you could take any bias you want and prove it in any um, large study like that. So if you wanted to say carrots cause cancer, you can do that sure. um, because there's a way you can manipulate the data to make it in your favor. And so his argument is epidemiology only can prove the bias of the reporter of the data. Um, and so Walter Willett has hung his hat on nutritional epidemiology. He is the author of so many papers, but only because they just churn out a new paper a week, what all his grad students do, which are, they're all funded by Barilla and um, Barilla other, is the pasta company in case anyone's wondering. Uh, yeah, other, other big food. Mm -hmm. And so he claims to have no conflict of interest when I pushed him on it. He's like, oh, well, I mean, you can't run a nutrition department without, you know, how are, how are my grad students supposed to get funded if not from Barilla? So it, it's, he's so, he's been called out so many times by so many people, especially in the low carb world for having massive conflicts of interest that he never declares. Um, and he is also the lead author on the Eat Lancet Report, which is the diet that I really hate because it is very likely to be um, endorsed by the United Nations very soon. Yeah. So he's, he's just awful. 
Yeah, he 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 is probably ten times as as bad as uh, Ansel Keys was to what happened to us. And the reason I feel that 80 percent of our population is fat now in America, would you agree? Maybe. I mean, I don't really know. I mean, it was a tidal wave when Ansel Keys came in because it really kind of started the whole momentum of like dietary guidelines and everything. So I, it, you know, levels of evil, I'm not sure, but um, certainly people still respect him. His next in lines are just as bad as him. Yeah. Um, there's a guy at Tufts I often argue with who's a little more moderate um, when it comes to meat. You know, he thinks that, you know, red meat is maybe or I think he, he admitted maybe butter is neutral. Um, <laughs> but uh, but we still have a long way to go in nutrition to in mainstream nutrition um, to, to get people to admit that there's never been a study proving that red meat causes cancer. There's no studies. Or anything, that. or heart disease, or anything else that Nothing. they claim. Uh, speaking of red meat, folks, bellcampo.com, bellcampo. I was just talking to Anya Fernal. Well, we weren't talking. We were emailing back and forth yesterday. Um, and uh, she is coming back on the show very soon. Bell Campo. Uh, the reason I was emailing her was uh, a fan, a guy named Daniel. I'll give you his whole name. Daniel Fry um, wrote to me and said, hey, man, I put in a promo code Vinny and I didn't get my 15% off. There was some kind of glitch for a few hours at Bell Campo. I got Anya online. We figured it out, folks. It's back up again, bellcampo.com, 15% off. Every time you put in promo code Vinny, Anya is coming back on the show. Bell Campo, B-E-L-C-A-M-P-O. This is, uh, you want to talk about great meat. Uh, Bell Campo is doing it right. And they've been doing it right for a long time. Uh, this is not factory farming. Uh, and by the way, we have not gotten one complaint about anyone saying, hey, my order showed up at my door and it was all melted because it was hot that day. But they pack this stuff right, they get it to your door, it's still frozen. I tell everyone, get at least $125 worth of Bel Campo. Even after, after the discount, you'll be over $100, but you will kick in the free shipping. Uh, I've been noticing on the order, some people are getting three, four, five, six, $800 worth of Bel Campo at a clip. Think about that savings. 15% off every single time. I tend to do that because I'm lucky enough in my garage, I have a deep freeze. And uh, in the winter, there might be a deer and they're all packed and packing it in. But in the summer months, there's a lot of room. I pack it with Bel Campo. We never have to wonder, oh, wait, did you stop and buy steaks? And No, no, we always have it. Belcampo.com. B-E-L-C-A-M-P-O, 15% discount with promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, no wimpy Y, and free shipping over $100 total. Go check it out. Um, we're talking to one of my favorites, Diana Rogers, who's been on the show before. Um, Diana, you don't just come by this because you care about meat or anything else. You are a registered dietitian. Correct? That's right. Talk about that a little bit. And do you ever get any pushback from the RDs? Um, I, I have kind of a funny career where I was, um, I, I studied fine art in college and I, I worked in as a furniture maker for a while. And then I became, I, I worked in um, food marketing. I worked for National Public Radio, worked for Whole Foods Market for many years. And then um, I, I was married to an organic farmer and um, started working on the farm uh, once I had kids because it was just too crazy to have a corporate job. And we were selling, we were hosting a raw milk co-op um, and I didn't know why all these people were coming in and getting all their butter and raw milk. And I, I was like, what is going on? Um, went to a Weston A Price conference and started eating more butter. Um, felt better. I did not end up having type two diabetes, uh, or I'm sorry, gestational diabetes. I did have that with my first pregnancy, but I didn't with my second wow. when I started eating more fat. Um, and I've never been overweight, but I, I am really sensitive to carbs. Um, and so started fixing my own diet and then, um, 
sort of started going down like the paleo low carb keto thing realized how great it was for me and then became a registered dietitian. So I went back to school um, later in my life after I already had kids and after I was already sold on sort of this ancestral way of eating. Uh, so it was really hard to go through school. Uh, you know, I'm the same age as the professors and I have all the papers to counter contradict everything they're saying. I'm sitting in the front row. I'm paying for all these classes myself. Simmons is not a cheap school. Um, and, and they would say stuff. And, I, and luckily I became friends with this guy, Matt Lalonde at um, Harvard through Rob Wolf. And so I, I was, I would text Matt and I would say, is it really is it really folic acid or should we be taking folate? You know, this professor saying this and he'd correct right. me and show me 17 papers that, you know, supported him. And um, so it was really nice for me to have that mentor. Um, anyhow, so I, I really, it was really painful to go through the program, really expensive. Um, I had to go work in hospitals. It was also good though. Like I learned how to tear apart a scientific paper. There's things that I did learn. Biochem is sort of right. pretty straightforward. Um, it was interesting to work in hospitals because uh, just to see how broken they are. I mean, the cafeterias have, they don't know what a carb is. You put someone on with diabetes on a low or carb diet. I had actually um, convinced my, uh, my boss at the hospital to, to try to talk about lower carb with with the diabetics, but then the cafeteria would just send up, you know, the standard, yeah. you know, cereal, low fat milk and, you know, carbs, banana. Um, and so, you know, I never want to do that again. I never want to work in a hospital again. Um, I, yes, I do get a lot of pushback from dietitians. I actually just did a um, class yesterday for dietitians and there was a, you know, a big, um, you know, Primal Kitchen was sponsoring this and it was for CEUs for dietitians. Yeah. And it was just all about the history of paleo and like, what do you do when someone comes to you and they ask about a paleo diet or a keto diet? Um, you know, try to be open-minded. Here's the background. Here's why they might be asking you about it. Here's how it can be healthy, you know, just trying to work that. And the comments were so awful. Um, the, the, you know, I could see in the chat box, what the dietitians were saying. And th there were so many, like, you are so wrong. Meat is proven to kill people, you know, all this stuff. And so they're really taught this though. It's hard to unlearn something that you've learned. I'm really glad that I walked into becoming an RD already being sold on, on this way of eating. Um, because I think, if I had become an RD when I was younger, I've always been interested in nutrition, but if I had done it undergrad, I'd probably be pushing, you know, I'd be very resistant to this um, new way of thinking probably too, just because I, I wasn't, you know, you, you believe your professors or you believe who's teaching you. So it's you hard. Know, I've, I'm, I've told the story several times on a podcast, but it bears repeating. <clears throat> I was um, on a dais um, at Princeton University. I want to say it was around 2013 or 14. It was early on because you got to, Diana, when I wrote my book back in around 2010, but the book didn't come out until like 2012, but I refused to put the word ketogenic in the book. And my co-author, Dean Laurie, kept saying, why? Because Dean Laurie is not from a health and fitness background. I wrote the entire book. He was helping me mold the book. Mm-hmm. And he said, why won't you put the word ketogenic? Why have you come up with this NSNG, no sugars, no grains? I said, because as soon as you put the word ketogenic, it's going to be misconstrued as ketoacidosis. I know. And everyone's going to call me a cook. This is in 2010, mm -hmm. right? This is 11, just 11 short years ago. And he goes, okay, it's your book. So I guess, you know, don't put it in. That's fine. The word ketogenic, you couldn't even use in 2010, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. This is before the internet was as crazy as it is now. I was on a dais and I, I want to say 2014, it might have been 2013 up at Princeton. And um, they got me there late. 
the guy picking me up from my hotel from Princeton, something got screwed up and they started and there was a seat for me up on the dais and they started five or six minutes before I got there. They rushed me in, they said, okay, just walk up. And they're already, they're doing everything. And I walk up and the, the person heading behind the, the, the podium says, uh, we finally got Vinny here. And I sit down and kind of wave to the audience and they continue with their conversation that had been going on. And um, I don't even know who's sitting on the dais with me, right? Because I do a lot of talks. I'm, I'm a wind up monkey, just wind me up, I'm gonna go on stage, I'm gonna do my thing. There's five other people sitting on that dais. And no research from me. I don't know who they are. And this woman says, well, I'm the head dietitian to major, major hospital in New York. I'll tell you off the air if you remind me. And um, because I don't want to, this, this woman came around. Um, she goes, I'm the major, I'm the head dietitian at this hospital. And the one thing I can tell you is fat burns in the flame of carbohydrates. Now, Diana, I don't even have my sea legs yet. I'm just sitting down. I'm in front of an audience. I'm a little blurry eyed to what's going on. But I hear this comment coming from a microphone to my left. Or in this case, to my right. And uh, <laughs> I immediately as soon as she said that I went, Robert Haas, circa 1983. And she goes, excuse me, I said, Robert Haas, circa 1983. He wrote that in a book. The book was called Eat to Win. And then everyone in the audience started smirking and groaning and, and the woman at the desk goes, Vinny joined us late. Vinny, you have something to say about this? I said, yeah, that's, that's completely wrong. What she's saying right now is completely wrong. One guy wrote that in a book that went popular in 1983. It could have been 84. I'm not sure. But he was trying to get the whole world to eat a mound of pasta. And that's when pasta became the health food for the next decade. And here we are again in 2014. And we have a registered dietitian telling you something that was untrue in 1983 or 84. And it's still untrue today. That was my opening salvo to an audience at Princeton University in 2014. Now, that's 20 years after I read it. It wasn't true in 1983. It wasn't true in 2014. It wasn't mm -hmm. true. Yet here is the head dietitian from a major hospital in New York City, just spewing this out. The beauty of this was, instead of her hating me, when we were done, she and her husband, he was sitting in the audience came over and said, Who are you? And what do you know? And I was like, Oh, boy, here we go. And we started having a conversation. And I told her about my book, I told her about people like um, uh, uh, J J uh, Jason Fung, I mentioned different people who were coming, I, I talked about um, uh, the guy that wrote the book on paleo who had been on my podcast a few times, um, the professor, um, Lauren, Lauren Cordain. Cordain. I, I, I mentioned uh, Tim Noakes, I mentioned Steve Finney, I was talking about these people. She was jotting all this down. Mm -hmm. She went home, she started looking all these people up, she looked up Jeff Volek, Steve Finney, uh, Lauren Cardain, Tim Noakes, she started looking guys she had never heard of before. Nina Tyshows, who was in your movie. Mm -hmm. Right? She looked up all of these people. She read Nina's book. She read Gary Taubes's first two or three books that he had out at the time. About six weeks later, I got a phone call from this woman. And she said, I've gone down every rabbit hole you sent me down. I said, Yeah, and she goes, I'm the head dietitian at a major hospital. I said, Yeah, I know that. And she goes, I can't unsee what I know now. And I said, I know. And she goes, 
I don't know how to continue in my job. This woman was having a midlife crisis in what she was telling people, she knew she could no longer lie to people. Now, whether she quit her job, I don't know. Whether she moved on, I don't know. I'm going to guess at some point she decided to try to do something. It didn't work and she fell back into the status quo. I don't know that either. I'm guessing. It's all a guessing game for me, right? Mm -hmm. But she did say, I cannot unsee the truth now. Most, most dietitians don't do what this woman did. And the only reason she did that was because I had the wherewithal to remember something I read in a book 21 years earlier. And I spewed it on stage while I was a still a little punch drunk from being on stage. Mm -hmm. That's all that happened. Right. But she knew this guy knows something. I need to go find out something. What, what, can we agree that most most dietitians don't do that? So most dietitians come it be, become dietitians because of a history of having an eating disorder, um, which is, you know, and so the, the whole idea that everything in moderation, all foods are good, there are no bad foods, you know, that is very strong and um, really firmly believed. Um, secondly, the, uh, the curriculum is set by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics in all schools. So people will come to me and they'll ask me, where can I become a dietitian? There are a handful of schools that add in a couple of extra like whole foods type classes. Um, but for the most part, all of them have the same exact curriculum. It's set by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is funded by the ultra processed food industry. Um, and Wait, I just want to, before you go on, I want to make sure I have this straight. Oh yeah. We take people with eating disorders that goes into a program that teaches them how to further an eating disorder, veganism. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, it's funny how um, when I would bring up an idea of like, you know, keto, whole 30, paleo type diet uh, in my classes, they would say, no, that's cutting out whole food groups, you know, but then somehow a vegan diet was tolerated because it's like, you know, all these, um, you know, ex anorexic young women who, you know, think that a, a suffering pig is, is like them suffering. And so they, of course, identify with vegans. Um, so it's, it's a really um, mentally ill <laughs> uh, uh, profession to, to get into in some ways. Um, you know, I came into it because I have a history of, of celiac and, and blood sugar dysregulation. I was just trying to find answers. Um, but anyway, it, it, there are dietitian, you know, private practice. I can, I can take insurance and I can say what I have evidence to back up. So, um, you know, just because someone's a dietitian doesn't necessarily mean that they don't know what they're talking about. There are, um, a growing group of dietitians who are, um, very forward thinking, um, and actually a lot of them support, I have a very large advisory circle on the Global Food Justice Alliance website of doctors and dietitians and other academics who all um, agree with me that, that animal source foods need to have, um, you know, a large group of, of folks pushing for their relevance in our food system. And so that's, that's what this project's all about. And, and there are a bunch of, you know, Lily Nichols is awesome. Um, there's, there's a, a whole group of, of dietitians and doctors who all are behind me. Great. No, no, I love hearing this because, you know, we can't, we, we pretend to care so much about kids, you know, it's like, Oh, kids and education and kids and education. The first thing they want to do is hype them up on sugar in the morning, which is the worst brain food in the world. And the second thing we try to do is not give them recess because we want them to keep learning. We take away PE. We take away all the things that help kids, you know, become good adults. And we go, okay, no PE, no recess, learn, 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 and eat sugar on top of sugar. All bad ideas. Mm -hmm. All bad ideas, yet we seem to just keep pushing this narrative, right? Yeah. And Diana, I don't know about you, but I yell about this all the time. Kids are not just fat anymore. Kids don't even look the way kids looked when I was a kid. And I'm 59 now, so I was a kid 50 years ago. 
Mm -hmm. right? Kids don't look the way they looked 50 years ago. Um, I don't know if you ever heard the song Like a Rock. By who? Really? Yeah. Bob Seger. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You may you may know it as a Chevy commercial. Uh, yeah. Like a rock. Okay. I was strong as I could be. Like a rock. <laughs> Nothing ever got to me. Like a rock. Uh-huh. That that was the song. Do you even know who Bob Seger is? Yes. Okay. He did a song called Like a Rock. Yep. And it was all about, man, when I was young, I was big, I was strong and holding. When I was a kid, kids, if a kid had his shirt off in the summertime, you would see serratus muscles running through right, right under the rib cage, right? Mm -hmm. You would see all these serratus muscles and you would see kids were sinewy and strong and you would look at them and go, okay, that's because the kid's climbing a tree. Now, if a parent lets a kid climb a tree, you're an insane parent, right? Mm -hmm. Kids were out playing baseball without sunscreen on. If you do that today, you're an insane parent, right? They don't even let kids play sports unless they're there handing them, you know, cupcakes and punch and everything else. Mm -hmm. Okay. All kids do is they have this device, a two by four inch screen, mm -hmm. right? They have this device. And they do this, Diana. And folks, you would have to watch the video. They're bent forward like this. They're bent and they're craning their necks like this. So when you see a kid today, I notice several things. The legs are underdeveloped. So they have these little skinny legs. And then they have kind of this fat coming out from their waist. And they have a turtle back because their back is used to sitting in a couch, humped over, so their vertebrae is not even forming correctly. They have, I call it the turtle shell back. Um, they're all humped over and their neck cranes up. And when they stand up straight, when I'm in airports or wherever I see people walking around, I'm taking note of this. They look like something from Aesop's fable. Mm -hmm. Any of his fables, mm -hmm. right? They, they look decrepit, they look bent over. And these are young kids, these are teenagers. They're not supposed to look like this. Mm -hmm. They're not doing what they're, they're playing games on this freaking device and it's not helping anyone, right? And on top of that, they're being told meat is bad. You go to New York, de Blasio has got Meatless Monday, the Green New Deal. We gotta take meat out of the diet. Mm -hmm. Take meat out. Get rid of meat. Meat is bad. I did a Sunday school show. I do five shows a week on my Sunday school show. Gina Grad, who does that show, she brought up a thing that says, if you eat a hot dog, for every hot dog you eat, you're taking a couple of minutes off your life. Number mm -hmm. one, that's bullshit. That study's never been done. Whoever's saying studies show, we know what it takes to fund a study. Right, Diana? Yeah. Was that study ever done? No. Same study shows that if you eat a peanut butter and jelly, you add minutes to your life. Bullshit. Mm -hmm. Bullshit. You're not going to tell me that you're going to have processed peanuts, sugar, and bread, and you're going to add time to your life. Bullshit. But that was in the same study. That never happened. Right. But that's what we're pushing. And that's what's out there. And that's what drives me nuts. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go off. But <laughs> just drives me crazy because we're so, going down this road. Go on. Uh, well, I just before before we end, um, I I can just let you know a little bit about this project that I'm working on because I'm I'm really pushing back against it both in the U.S. and globally um, because so the the United Nations the the Secretary General of the United Nations has um, appointed the, the head of this Eat Lancet diet, the, the woman who commissioned Walter Willett, to be in charge of an action track about sustainable consumption of foods. And so her diet, which only allows for one blueberry's worth of meat per person per day, half an ounce of red meat per person per day, you can have one ounce of chicken per person per day, um, but yet you can have twice as much sugar like added sugars Crazy. On this diet. Um, it's a ridiculous, radical, unproven, untested diet 
that um, completely will not work um, in most parts of the world. Um, you know, from an agriculture per systems perspective, from a human health perspective, from a culturally appropriate, I mean, it's so incredibly ballsy to be flying around in your private jet, but then tell other people that they need to eat less meat because of emissions. Right. right. But this is what she's doing. And uh, this is not going through the normal voting process that most United Nations uh, initiatives have. So uh, it's just going to be accepted. It's happening in New York City on September 23rd. Uh, so for your listeners that are in New York, if they want to follow me, um, there might be some ruckus that I'm going to be uh, hosting in New York around the summit um and so they can come see me and find out where i'm going to be and um uh working on that plan right now um they can visit uh my social media page glo at global food justice on instagram globalfoodjustice.org um and get on the newsletter list learn more there's a ton of research i have up there and statistics about the importance of animal sourced food. So, I mean, we lead with meat, but it's all animal sourced foods. It's, it's, you know, dairy products. It's, you know, even one egg a day in, in studies with kids have shown just remarkable improvements in places where kids are undernourished. Um, I'm super, super passionate as a mother and a dietitian about this. And as someone who understands sustainable food systems, you cannot have a vegan food system or a food system that, you know, just allows for a little puny croutons worth of meat in the diet. It's not going to work. Um, and it's elitist. And so that's why I'm calling it the, the Global Food Justice Alliance is because I'm really trying to point out that it's an unjust perspective to, to try to, I mean, even meatless Mondays, it's well intended, but it is completely wrong to pull meat away from New York city public kids because they're 70% of those kids would qualify for school lunch. If, uh, if they didn't just offer it for free for everybody in New York, because of so many kids that do qualify, they're trying to take the stigma away. And so all kids in New York get free school lunch there's propaganda all over the schools about how meat is gonna kill you and it's horrible for the environment. That information is absolutely wrong. It's unscientific as no place in the public schools. Um, and it's, it's a company that's funded by Beyond Burger that's going in there and trying to change the food policy in, in schools and indoctrinating these kids in New York, you know, from, from kindergarten through grade 12 with all these anti-meat messages, it's really wrong. Oh, there's so many kids that say to me, but isn't, you know, I can lose weight on me, but isn't it bad for you? I, you'd be shocked at how I do consults every day, Diana. And that's the, the one thing people go, well, you know, you say meat. Folks, today, right now, before I did this podcast, about 45 minutes before I did this podcast, I drank six raw eggs. Now, I do not recommend raw. You should cook your eggs. I'm taking a chance on salmonella when I do that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm not recommending you do that. Drink six raw eggs. I'll probably eat two or three more eggs today after my workout. I'm going to eat red meat tonight. This is every day of my life. Every day. I go get calcium scans. Zero. Zero. That, that, my calcium builds up is zero because you can't get, you know, my cholesterol is in check. Nothing bad is happening to me because of meat. There's one other good thing that's happening to me. I went on a ketogenic diet full time after my cancer in 2007. They told me I would have a recurrence within five years, meaning they would have to put me on chemo again in five years because they knocked it down into a, um, a form where they could just keep knocking it back. Let's see, well, seven to 17, that was 10 years. 17 to 21. We're at over 14 years, folks, since I've had cancer. I have not been on chemo yet. That's not to say that next year I won't be, or later this year. But I didn't go five years. I didn't go six years or seven. I didn't go 10. I'm at 14 years of no chemo, living on a ketogenic diet. Now, does that have anything to do with it? I'm an N1 experiment. 
and I'm very, very on top of what I'm doing. I get proper rest, take my vitamins every day, all things I did before, okay? The difference is I cut all sugars and all grains out. On rare occasions, Christmas time, I'm gonna be in England at one of my sister-in-law's houses, the famous one, which means she'll probably have desserts and pies around, I'll, I'll probably partake. There'll probably be a day or two when I'll be out of ketosis. I'll be right back on. That works for me. That works for me. Right? I can do that. Because I don't want to be on chemo. I know what chemo feels like. So when people go, man, you get really passionate. Why, why do you care? Why do you care about others? Because I know how I felt. Right? I would encourage everyone here to go watch Sacred Cow the movie. Amazon and iTunes, right, Diana? Yep. Yep. It's on Amazon and I Amazon and iTunes. We've got an audio book version. The book is very different than the film. The book is really amazing. It's it's not just stories of farmers like the film. It's it's um, the full arguments. Will meat cause cancer? Is meat bad for the environment? Do cows take up too much land? I mean, we really, we even have like a choose your own adventure style thing in the beginning with all the common questions and the pages you can find the answers. Um, so it's it's a really good book for folks who um, want to understand and, and, and uh, be able to defend meat. Um, and then, yeah, if Folks could go check out uh, Global Food Justice if they're interested in in supporting me there and um, seeing all the the research and um, and what's going on with this anti meat policy because a meat tax is a very likely thing that is next. Um, having you know warning labels on fresh red meat in the cases like they do in France is something that's very likely to happen here um, and. Folks who eat meat tend to be pretty laid back and pretty like, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to like enjoy my meat, more meat for me if the vegans aren't going to eat it. It's really time to make sure that we maintain access to meat because um, it's it's getting really bad and it's going to really impact the health status of young people moving forward. Think of it this way, vegans. If they take meat out of the grocery store, there's going to be more of us killing Bambi, killing Burr Rabbit, killing <laughs> Mr. Moose. There is no cartoon elk, but ki killing an elk because we're not going to stop eating meat. We're just going to just go source it ourselves right on the hoof. So don't think that this is going away because it's not. Um, Diana, hang on. I'm going to say goodbye to you off the air. Folks, if you like okay. what we're doing here, Oh, I left this out. I'm so sorry. Villa Capelli olive oil. <clears throat> Villa Capelli is the, lo the longest running sponsor of the show. Even the vegans agree that Villa Capelli and all olive oil is a healthy option. There's nothing ever bad said about olive oil. So go check out Villa Capelli. There's no seed oil mixed in. It's 100% pure olive oil. I not only use it here at home, Anna uses it in all of her Eat Happy Cookbook stuff and at Eat Happy Kitchen. It's in Anna's marinara sauce. And it's also in my vitamin D over at Pure Vitamin Club. Excuse me, dot com. So go check out everything at Villa Capelli. You want to get 10% off, put in promo code Vinny, V-I-N-N-I-E, and uh, you'll get 10% off every time. Go to VinnyTotteries.com before you go to Amazon. We also have a super fan page. You can check out Global Food Justice and check out everything Diana Rogers is doing. You could just plop in Diana Rogers right into the Google machine and she'll come right up. Check out her movie, Sacred Cow, her book, Sacred Cow, and the audio book. It's all there. It's all great stuff. As a matter of fact, I'm a little jealous because she's a much better movie maker than I am. <laughs> um, so go check out what she's doing there on behalf of Diana Rogers. My name is Vinny Todorich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm.